and welcome to Wobi. It's great to have you with us. Hello and welcome to On The Record. I'm Chris Stanley. I'm here at the Radio City Music Hall in New York, where the World Business Forum is currently taking place. And I'm delighted to be joined today by Daniel Gilbert. Daniel is a Harvard psychologist and author of the best-selling book, Stumbling on Happiness. Dan is one of the world's foremost experts on the issue of happiness, decision-making, and, and how both of these impact the sort of lives that we lead. Today, I'm going to be discussing some of these issues with him today. Dan, it's good to have you with us. Pleasure to be here. Um, one of the key themes in, in, in the book, Stumbling on Happiness, is this idea that um, we, we frequently make decisions that we, we come to regret, and, and it looks at why we, st why, why we do that. Um, I'm sure this is something that is, is common to most, people, uh, to most people watching. You know, I, I make a decision, I, it's not, things don't turn out how I like. So wh why does this happen? Why do we do this? Well, you know, there's, there's two kinds of decisions that you can make and regret. The kind that you regret because they didn't turn out as you thought, and the kind you regret because they turned out precisely as you knew they would. And for psychologists, it's really the second kind that's the most mysterious. So you make a financial investment and you think you're going to earn money, but you don't. Of course you regret it, but who knows the future? The more interesting regrets we have are the kinds of regrets we experience when we have an extramarital affair, or we eat too much chocolate cake, or we fail to save for retirement, we don't clean our teeth, we do all sorts of things that any rational person, if you ask them, would say, well, yeah, I know I'm going to regret this later. Why do we do now things that we know for sure our future selves will regret? I think that's one of the great mysteries of human behavior. And that is one of the great mysteries. And what sort of insights have you come to when it comes to un trying to understand that? You know, you have to understand that the human brain was not designed for the world in which we currently live. Our brain evolved over a long period of time for a very different world than the one we live in. It's beautifully optimized to do things like find mates and find food and live in very small groups. It's very poorly designed for a complex world like the modern world in which we live. And so it's not much of a mystery that the brain has tendencies that suited us very well in the past, but not in the present. Mm -hmm. One of those is a strong emphasis on now and a neglect of later. You know, uh, 5,000 years ago, you didn't have to worry very much about your retirement because your life was likely to last about 20 years. You didn't have to think much about the future because there probably wasn't one and the present was so pressing and dangerous. Today it's a very different story, but we're still you know, navigating the ocean with the ancient vessel that evolved in, in uh, prehistoric times. Because it's interesting, I mean, you say that, but we spend most of our lives worrying about the future, don't we, these days? Well, aren't we told a lot of the time we need to live more in the present and stop worrying about the future? High levels of stress and depression, all those sorts of things that we see today? Well, you know, there are people who say that we think too much about the future, we have to learn to live in the moment. Um, to that I say, oh, rubbish. <laughs> I mean, name a human problem a really compelling problem that faces humanity, that faces societies, that is not about our neglect of the future. Oh no, we're living quite well in the present. We're spending like there's no tomorrow, we eat like there's no tomorrow, we smoke like there's no tomorrow, we do everything like there's no tomorrow. We need to think much more seriously, deeply, and hard about the future. Not only ours, but the future of our children and our grandchildren. It's all too easy to live in the moment. If you want to live in the moment, you should be a mosquito. They live in the moment. Human beings have a part of their brain that enables them to think about the future, and it's a shame to neglect to use it. So how can we start to use this more effective, this part of the brain you're talking about more effectively so that we can imagine our futures better and, and, and make better decisions? Well, that's a very deep and interesting question. There isn't a simple answer. When decision theorists and psychologists and economists study the errors people make because they don't think much about the future, they don't come up with a single simple remedy, a lesson you could learn, a pill you could take, a little bit of surgery you could have that would just turn you into something, to, into someone with deep foresight. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. Nonetheless, we're starting to understand some tricks to making people care more about their future selves. We now know that the human brain regards the future self as if it were another person. Who are the other people you care about and help and do nice things for the most? People who are like you. It turns out to the extent that you can get people to think of their future selves as like them, 
they're kinder to their future selves. They save for more for their retirement. They, they show patience in the present so that their future self will be healthy and well. So we're just starting to learn some of the little tricks we can use to make people more patient in their, in their economic and other decisions. What you're suggesting is that when we're thinking about a, a potential course of action, one of the things that we should take into account isn't how we feel about this potentially. We should look around at how people like us who have done similar things in similar situations and how they have behaved and how they've turned out. Well, there's no doubt that this is true. Um, when we try to figure out how much we're going to like something in the future, we usually close our eyes and imagine, oh, ice cream would be good. Oh, getting married will be, or children will be great. We're using imagination, but imagination is a very fickle friend. It lets us down all the time. What studies show is that the best way to make decisions about how much you will like something in the future is to examine the people who have that thing in the present. Whatever you are imagining, whatever career you're imagining, whatever life choice you're imagining, somebody has already done it. If the people who do this thing aren't very happy, the odds are you're not going to be happy either. You mentioned marriage and children there. They're two things. They've got to make you happy, haven't they? They absolutely should, and yet they don't. Marriage does, children don't. The data on marriage suggests that marriage is a source of happiness for most people. A good marriage particularly. Bad marriages are not, but good marriages are. Married people live longer, they're healthier, they earn more money per capita, they have more sex and enjoy it more. They do almost everything that you think would bring happiness more than unmarried people. So marriage is a pretty, you know, I do are two words that you could probably use to increase your happiness. With that said, children are another thing entirely. Now, as a parent, I feel like, you know, my child is the most important thing in the world, the greatest source of happiness. Parents say this to me all the time, but the data unequivocally show this just isn't true. People with children are not happier than people without children. People with children are not happier when their children live with them than after they go. All of that simply isn't the case. You're kidding yourselves then when you say that they're the most important things and they're... Well, they could be the most important things, and we're not kidding ourselves about that, but we are wrong if we say, my child has made me happier than I would have been if I didn't have them. The data suggests this simply isn't the case. And what kind of data could those be? Well, we could compare people who have kids and people who don't. And if your theory is right, that children bring happiness, then those childless people should be miserable. Let's go find out. Oh, it turns out they're just as happy as everybody else. When it comes to um, making decisions, are there certain emotional states um, in which we make better decisions and in which we make worse decisions? Yes, but it's hard to know what they are. Um, the old wisdom, for hundreds of years, we thought emotion was the enemy of reason. That really a, a cool, calm head made the best decisions and we should try to get rid of our emotions. It turns out in the last 20 or 30 years, psychologists have learned that emotion is often the friend of reason. It often helps us make decisions. And indeed, people who, because of neurological deficits, aren't able to experience emotion, one of the things that they have trouble with is decision making. They, when they look into the future, they don't feel that little pang of fear when they imagine being arrested. They don't feel the little jump of joy when they imagine getting married. So they have a lot of trouble trying to decide what they should do next because nothing seems to feel good or feel bad when they imagine it. So the relationship between emotion and reason turns out to be a little more complicated uh, than centuries of philosophers have taught us. Mm. So, okay, emotion is important, but what about what type of emotion? If you're happy, do you make better decisions than if you're sad or angry or? It just depends what you're making decisions about. Okay. One of the things about emotions is that when you're experiencing them, it's very hard to imagine experiencing the opposite. So when you're angry, it's very difficult to imagine that in 15 minutes, you're gonna have your arms around your wife and you're gonna be delighted to be married to her. You're so angry that you can't imagine that it would dissipate. At that moment, when you're experiencing anger, you're not in a good position to make decisions about how you will feel when you're experiencing the opposite. So emotions envelop us. They make us feel, uh, they, they, they harness us into the present. And they can aid our decision making in some kinds of decisions, but not in all. Um, technology is something that's developed a lot in recent years, and, and there's been a lot of uh, a lot of talk, a lot of people, a lot of words written about how technology is um, impacting us at 
at an emotional level, at a psychological level, the addiction as some people talk about to our iPhones or, or, or smartphones. Well, have you any thoughts about that, the uh, relationship between technology and our psychological well-being? Certainly if the kind of technology you're talking about are social media, the evidence is mixed. We know that social relationships are the single best predictor of a human being's happiness. Mm -hmm. So the more social relationships you can have, usually the happier you are. So think about Facebook. We have many more friends than we ever did. There do seem to be ways in which spending time on social media connecting with other people can increase your happiness. But there also seem to be ways in which it can decrease your happiness, namely if it takes the place of real face-to-face -face relationships. Social media is a nice addition to our regular social lives, but it's no substitute. Okay, great. Well, we're coming to the end of our time, Dan, so I'd like to close if we could. I mean, maybe you could offer um, two or three small things that we could perhaps do to, to become, um, become happier and start making, make, making better decisions about our future. Are there any tricks, tactics um, that you have, you have found that you could share with us? Well, I think the first thing anybody who wants to improve their happiness should think about is relationships with family and friends. And I only say this because we know it's the single best predictor of a human being's happiness. If you have good relationships with family, many and good relationships with friends, it's gonna be a lot harder for you to be unhappy. And yet most of us neglect our social relationships while we try to earn money. Money really makes people happy when it moves them from poverty into the middle class. Big, big effects of making poor people safe and secure, giving them three meals a day. But once you have the basics that money can buy, more money does very, very little. And if you're spending your time chasing extra dollars, instead of investing in social relationships, you're not making a very good investment in your own happiness. Okay, well that's great. Thank you for those insights today, Dan. It's been a pleasure to have you with us. My pleasure indeed. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. It's been great to have you with us too for this um, episode of On The Record. We look forward to having you with us again. And until the next time, goodbye.